Mining is a noisy business. Did you know that one out of every four mine workers has a hearing problem? Even worse, four out of five mine workers have a hearing impairment when they reach mid-60s retirement age. 76% of all mine workers are exposed to hazardous noise. In underground mines, the biggest noise generators are typically drills, especially the percussive pneumatic types that are used to break hard rock materials. These drills can create noise levels up to 115 decibels. And then there's the noise generated by continuous miners, roof bolting machines, and mobile equipment. In surface mines, let's say pits, quarries, or coal strip mines, you've got front end loaders, scrapers, graders, dozers, trucks, and again, pneumatic drills. And then there's the use of explosives, in some situations, extremely loud. When you're exposed to these hazardous levels up to eight hours a day or more, you can see why so many miners suffer hearing loss to one degree or another. Back in 1997, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, analyzed a large number of minor audiograms, and they found that by age 50, approximately 90% of coal miners and 49% of metal non-metal miners had hearing impairment. Shortly afterwards, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, MSHA, set new health standards for occupational noise exposure. And these required mine operators to use all feasible engineering and administrative controls to reduce miners' noise exposure to a permissible exposure level. A hearing conservation program was set up for assessing noise exposure, providing audiometric hearing tests, using hearing protectors, and training. Mine operators were also required to start ensuring that no miner is exposed at any time to sound levels exceeding 115 dBA. Today, mining still represents the highest prevalence rate of hazardous noise exposure in any work sector. Recently, I got in touch with my contacts at NIOSH to see what's going on these days with hearing loss prevention in mining. I spoke with Dr. Amanda Asman at the NIOSH Mining Research Division in Pittsburgh. She's a doctor of audiology there and is going to tell us all about a fairly new hearing project that she's involved with right now. The most recent thing that is taking place is a project that's looking into hearing conservation programs in mining, how effective they are at actually reducing the incidence of hearing loss in miners, how they are undertaking different activities to promote noise safety and to assure that their workers are protected from noise to the greatest extent possible. The first activity was to go to a selection of mines and conduct area noise samples. So the idea behind area noise samples is that you take a working area and then you go through that area and collect noise data in predefined locations, usually at every meter or two meters, dependent on the size of that area. Then you use those noise samples to determine if that is a noise hazardous area for workers. The second step was to conduct personal noise measurements of workers in various areas. That's through using a noise dosimeter that's affixed usually on the shoulder or near the upper body of a worker. The noise dosimeter collects information about the noise exposure of that worker throughout their shift. During that same time, we also use what we call a helmet cam application. So that's basically a point of view video that would show where that worker was while he or she was accruing that noise exposure. After that data collection, we paired up those first two sets of data to show where that worker was experiencing that noise exposure in addition to the area noise measurements we had previously collected. That would allow us to say, hey, these area noises where this worker is operating are hazardous, we've shown that, or conversely, this worker is showing a noise exposure in an area that we did not identify as noise hazardous. So we need to take a step back and look at that a little more thoroughly. The last step that we haven't gotten to yet is to do some personal interviews with miners to find out their feelings or their experiences with noise at their work sites. That is currently still in the works. 
As part of the hearing conservation program, the employer is required to provide two types of earplugs and two types of earmuffs to use as hearing protection for their workers. There are other really simple steps that workers can take to try to protect their own hearing. For example, one thing to do is when there is a cab available on a machine, um, mobile equipment particularly, is to remain inside that cab and keep the windows and the doors closed. Also, when there are noise controls that have been installed by the company, such as curtains or barriers, make sure those are in working order. And if they're not in working order, the mine worker should report that to their employer. Another thing is to, to maintain machines. So for example, when a machine becomes damaged or it's starting to show wear, there might be squeaks or rumblings that can add to the noise exposure. It's important to replace broken, worn out, and misused parts so that machines can maintain optimal working order. And again, move away from loud areas. So if you're going on your lunch break and there's a designated lunch room with walls and doors that can be closed, the workers should go in there and take their break rather than just sitting next to some machine that is producing a loud amount of noise. There's a NIOSH sound level meter application. It's designed to work with a smartphone and it's very simple to use. You open up the app and you press a few buttons and it will tell you the noise exposure of that area where you are currently. That's really designed more for finding your point by point noise exposure. The sound contour map applications in development is really more geared towards finding an area noise sample not one for one specific area where you're standing. If you'd like to know more about hearing loss in minors and how to reduce the risks, I encourage you to start by going online to cdc.gov and searching for mining topic, hearing loss prevention overview. There's lots and lots of great information there, including links to some of the software and apps that we've mentioned. And if you'd like to get in touch with Dr. Asman to learn more, her email address is shown here on the screen. Now, up next, it's time to take a look at Core Safety's module number six, emergency management. It's all about the process of identifying, planning for, and responding to emergency and crisis situations. An effective safety and health management system is designed to prevent incidents from occurring. However, a well-designed, trained, and tested emergency management system is also necessary. That's because even if your company finally achieves zero incident performances, there will always be the potential for uncontrollable factors ranging from earthquakes to heart attacks. Emergency management includes emergency prevention. What do you need to do to prevent a non-emergency from becoming an emergency? Planning. What can go wrong, both expected and unexpected, and how should you respond? Emergency resources. What materials, equipment, information, and people do you need in order to deal with the emergency? Training. Who needs to do what when an emergency occurs? Coordination and communication. What government agencies and non-governmental stakeholders need to be involved and how do you coordinate to manage the emergency with key groups? For example, the media. Where will they be staged? And how will updates or briefings be provided? Or families. How will you ensure their privacy? And how will you meet their needs? Where will you put families on site so they don't have to interact with the media? How will communications be conducted with the families? And finally, recovery. Once the real emergency is addressed, how do you recover? These plans should consider potential impacts to the workforce, the public, the environment, and company assets. Good management plans can prevent a worsening of an emergency and by protecting responders, can prevent additional incidents from occurring. Remember, 
your company must have the capability to respond appropriately to emergency and crisis situations. To learn more about module number six, just visit our website at coresafety.org. And next month, we'll see a summary of module number seven, culture enhancement. So that's all for now. Please remember that anytime you're online, be sure to follow our post on Facebook and Twitter. For Core Safety and the National Mining Association, I'm Nelson Duffel. I'll see you back here again next month with a new safety story. Until then, please be safe out there and thanks for watching. Special thanks this month to NIOSH, to our helpful contacts at the CDC, and to Dr. Amanda Asman for her interview on hearing conservation for minors. To share one of your safety stories, videos, or photos, email us at info at coresafetytv.org.